This next example is a game between Anatoly Karpov and Vlastimil Hort, two very strong grandmasters. Karpov was obviously world champion for a long time himself. Now in this position, Black's last move was moving his pawn from g7 to g6. And that was probably a mistake because it weakened the f6 square. Now normally I prefer bishops to knights, but in this situation the white bishop doesn't have any obvious targets to attack. And although bishop e4 wouldn't be a bad move, white spotted that pawn to g6 was a mistake because black weakened the f6 square and now he takes advantage of that. The f6 square is a really good square for his rook to be on because it can pressure both the king side and queen side at the same time and it'll be a very active piece. So in this position Anatoly Karpov played a probably slightly unusual move. He gave his bishop up for the knight with bishop takes d7 and this was a very good decision. Black plays rook takes d7 and now white plays rook to f1. The white rook is aiming for the f6 square. He knows on f6 he's going to tie black down really badly. Black's going to be tied down to the f7 pawn and he can also try and attack on the queen side. So after rook to f1, black tries king to b8. And black's going to try and take this a5 pawn when the rook comes into f6. However, his king's going to be a long way from the action. White finds a clever way to break through on the king side. White plays rook to f6, king to a7, and now pawn to h5. So white's putting a lot of pressure on black's king side. White's obviously thinking if the pawns are exchanged, for example g takes h5, g takes h5, then he'll be able to win the h pawn with rook takes h6, and his own h pawn will become very strong. So instead of playing g takes h5, Vlastimil Hort decides to play king to a6. His plan is to allow white to play h takes g6 so that white can't create a passed pawn. However, Anatoly Karpov has other ideas and manages to create a passed pawn anyway with the move pawn to g5. A very strong move and quite a typical move in endgame positions. White realises his best chance of winning is to create a passed h pawn. He can't create one straight away by playing h takes g6 because if he plays h takes g6, f takes g6, rook takes g6, then maybe black can hope to defend with a move like rook to h7, defending the h pawn. Now it's not clear that white's not winning anyway, but by creating a passed h pawn, it was much more certain the outcome of the game. In this position, Anatoly Karpov found a very strong move. He played the move pawn to g5, creating a passed h-pawn. White realised having a passed pawn is definitely the best way to try and win this position. And this is quite a common endgame idea. White sacrifices a pawn in order to create a passed pawn. We've seen this a lot in king of pawn endgames, but in rook and pawn endgames it also applies. So after pawn to g5, black plays h takes g5 and now white plays pawn to h6 and that h pawn is going to be very hard for black to stop. Black plays king takes a5 and now pawn to h7. Black's forced to play rook to d8. Rook takes f7 and we see here in this position the white rook completely dominates the black rook. It's a very active piece it's going to come to g7, threatening rook to g8, and the black rook will be very passively placed on h8. And when you have an active rook against a passive rook in a situation like this, it's almost always winning. So I'll just show a couple more moves. Black played pawn to b5, and after c takes b5, king takes b5, white played the move rook to b7 check. Now this is also worth noting, White wants to put his rook on g7 because he wants to threaten rook to g8 and force the black rook to h8. But before he puts his rook on g7, he decides he might as well force the black king to a worse square. It's always worth looking out to see if you've got a sort of intermediate move to make your opponent's position worse. And in this situation, rook to b7 check actually just makes his opponent's king go to the a file, which is not where it wants to be, a bit further away from the action. So after rook to b7 check, Black has to move to the a file and he plays king to a6 
And now white returns rook to g7, threatening rook to g8. Black plays rook to, rook to h8, and white plays king to e4. And white's winning plan is simply to play king to f3, king to g4, and take both the g pawns. And after that, he can win the black rook. So Anatoly Karpov went on to win this endgame very easily from this position. And I think the real key moment was when he got his rook into f6. The move pawn to g6 was a mistake. It allowed white's rook onto a very active square. Remember, you always want to think, you know, what's the best square for my pieces? But you also want to think, what's the best square for my opponent's pieces? And how can I stop him from getting his pieces to his best squares? So in summary, white won this game because he found a very active square for his rook. So it's very important to think, you know, which squares do I want my pieces on and how do I get them there? And from Black's point of view, he should also be thinking, which squares do my opponent want to get his pieces on and how can I stop him from getting his pieces to their best squares? So this situation, White's simple winning plan is to play king to f3, king to g4 and take both of the g-pawns. And if the black king ever attacks the d-pawn, for example if the black king gets to c4, White can simply play rook to d7 and protect it. So Anatoly Karpov won this position very simply and really it was all down to creating a past h-pawn and having a very active rook. In comparison, Black's rook got stuck on h8, which is very passive, and his king's on a6, which is a very bad square. So the black pieces are very badly placed, and the white pieces are very well placed. In in games, you really need to have active pieces at all times, and this is no example. And as a result, white was able to win this endgame. Yeah.